السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا صاحب السجن أما أحدكما فيسقي ربه خمرا وأما الآخر فيصلب فتأكل الطير من رأسه قضي الأمر الذي فيه تستفتيان وقال للذي ظن أنه ناج منه مذكرني عند ربك فأنساه الشيطان ذكر ربه فلبس في, الثج في السجن بضع سنين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد once again everybody السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today I'm going to try to cover uh, ayahs number 40 and 41 of Surah Yusuf. And uh, this is two things. One is a concluding uh, conversation that he had in regards to the, the, the question that these two young men came and asked uh, Yusuf alayhi salam and he's going to finish answering them and, and give them the response that they were looking for. And then in addition, there's going to be an, a, the, the final ayah which is about a request that he makes to one of them, the one that's going to be escaping. So we'll look at some of the lessons that we can draw from it. Uh, but uh, and at the end of the 40th ayah, there's something as an overview that I wanted to share with you that I think may be of benefit. And I think some of you that are in the field of da'wah or have experience speaking with non-Muslims about Islam or have held you know, the kinds of awareness weeks or booths or kind of, you know, th those kinds of avenues where people come and ask you questions about the faith, this might be of some benefit to you, inshallah ta'ala. And I think you can take it a lot further than what I'm going to be listing here for you, inshallah. Uh, in any case, so let's start with Ya Sahiba Sijin, my two companions of the prison. He's repeating that phrase now for the second time. The first time he said, my two companions of the prison are multiple masters better that are multiple masters of different kinds pit pitted against each other better than Allah. The one, the overwhelming. That was the first time you saw my two, you know, my two companions of prison. But now again, Ya Sahib Sijin, my two companions in prison, the phrasing is actually a term of endearment. And it's also, you know, before he even says what they asked about, he's kind of softening it by addressing them in this way. So this is, this is a kind of way of acknowledging. This is a kind of way of um, making someone feel valued by actually calling them by their name or calling them by some kind of title before you, uh, you know, answer what they, what they did and, uh, or what they asked about. And so in a sense, there's a full attention being given to these two young men by Yusuf alayhi salam. They're being treated kind of like VIPs by them being addressed in this way over and over again. And so he did give them a pretty hard message about Allah and a straightforward, you know, comprehensive picture of da'wah. He did all of that. But now he also wants to let them know that I'm not just here to warn you or to preach to you, I care about you, you're my friends. And I'm, and I'm talking to you in that capacity. I'm still someone who's concerned with you. And you shouldn't be thinking, man, we asked about something else and here he is talking about something else. No, you're my friends, let me tell you what you asked about. So he actually now consoles them again. So you notice a dominant theme in this brief conversation he's had with them, that the Qur'an pretty much records in its entirety, is that it begins with consideration for them and it ends with consideration for them. And so now that it, it's coming to an end, he says, "Imma ahadukuma rabbahu khamra." As for one of you, uh, then he's going to. It seems that he's going to then be uh, serving the drink to his master. And the master here is a reference to the king, because every, you know they had ministers and governors who had slaves and they had masters. We're going to find out eventually that the, this guy who's serving drinks, the old name is cup bearer. We don't have cup bearers anymore. We have waiters in restaurants or maybe butlers like Batman or something. But the idea of a cup bearer is someone who his only job is to make the drink for you, you know, squeeze the juices or make the wine and bring it and serve it to you. So that's the cup bearer. So he says, as for one of you, because remember his dream was that I'm squeezing wine or I'm, I'm, I'm pressing wine. So he says, you're going to be serving wine to your master, which is... Maybe he used to have that job before, you're going to get your old job back possibly. Or when you go back, your, your master is going to give you the job of having you serve him drinks. You would imagine though that that kind of a job for especially the king would have to go to somebody experienced in the best making of wine. Wine is a delicacy, it's expensive, etc. I don't know anything about that, I have no experience. But I'm saying it's known around the world that wine, especially for the higher ups, is a different caliber of kind of wine. So the people who make it are a special kind, they have a certain specialization. So he, he must have had some pretty exotic experience in this field for him to come out of prison and get that high profile, you know, royal chef or royal cup bearer job. 
So it's not just that he's a waiter, but actually he's, he's the one pressing the wine and then serving it to his master. So he, you're going to get your old job back, basically, is what Yusuf Alayhi is telling him. al akhar, and as for the other, uh, then the thing is that he's going to get crucified. He's going to get uh, crucified, suggests publicly executed. That's what that means. And the, the idea is the way it's, the, that happens, it may be on a cross, it may be some other way, but they're hung in public or they're, they're nailed in public or they're you know, excruciatingly killed in public and their body is left outside for others to learn a lesson from it. Don't repeat that crime because that'll be you if you do that. So it's, it's left as a kind of a warning and a deterrent for other criminals. right? So that's why they do that. So that's Fayuslabu. He's going to be made an example of. His body is going to be made an example of by the way that you're executed. Fata'kulu tayru min ra'sihi. Then vultures are going to be eating off of his head. Uh, so it's interesting that he, in both cases, used the third person. For one of you, he is going to be serving. For the other one, he is going to be crucified. Not you're going to be serving, you're going to be crucified. He didn't say you and you, even though he started with the yous. He started with my two companions. For one of you, here's what's going to happen to him. And the other one, here's what's going to happen to him. And this is important because for one of them at least, the news is really terrible. It's a pretty like, horrifying bit of news that I'm going to get executed in a couple of days. And not only that, my body is going to be mutilated to the point where I'm not going to get a burial. There's going to be vultures that are going to be coming and picking off of my brains. That's how badly it's, I'm going to be, you know, uh, uh, you know dis- my body is going to be destroyed. By the way, if you think about it, the skull is the strongest bone in the body, including the, the, the rib cage. These are the strongest bones that we have. So for birds to come and eat from here, they'd have to break through the skull. You understand that? So that means that his head is going to be cracked open for birds to come and eat. Otherwise, they don't, they don't got much to eat up here. You understand? So it's actually pretty excruciating death that he's going to be given, maybe a blow to the head or something like that as he's, as he's made to lay out in, in public. And that's why the birds have access to, the vultures have access to what this carrion meat that they're going to be eating. So it's pretty graphic that what, he, what he's telling them. The, not using the you, because for one of them when he said, hey, you're going to get out of here, he would feel really good. But that would actually make it all the more painful for the other one who's not going to get out. Right, So the word you would have been really uh, consoling for the one who gets out, but the same word you would have been a stab, an additional stab to the one who's not going to get out, who's going to get executed. So he, as a, it seems as a mercy to the one that's not getting out, use the third person for both of them. He, one of you, he is going to be serving wine. And the other one, he is going to be, you know, so he, kind of, he knows that bad news is bad, so he kind of lessens the blow as much as he can in breaking it to them. Now, it can also be thought about that what he's going to tell them is, one of them, fine, he's really happy about the news, the other one's really upset about the news, and maybe I shouldn't tell him because he's going to be so angry with me. You know how we get angry at the weatherman? (laughs) Right? We get angry at the news channel that's giving a news report or whatever. So, you know, because he's delivering the news, maybe they'll be so mad at me, they won't even listen to the da'wah I just gave them. They'll forget all about it. Right? So maybe I shouldn't tell them this, but it's going to happen anyway. So why, you know, maybe I shouldn't go out of my way to tell them. The, the lesson we're learning here is be straightforward, even if you don't think it's going to go in your interest. My job isn't, your job isn't, and Yusuf Islam's job is not to convert anyone. Our job is to clearly convey the message to someone in a considerate and a compassionate way. And if we made a promise to help someone, then we're going to, and he already knew that bad news, the moment he heard them tell the dream, he already knew what, what it means. So as he's talking to them, in fact, he's, even the da'wah he's making to them, he's taking into consideration the situation they're going to find themselves in. So they're going to find themselves in this, one of them is going to find themselves, let's think of one of them at a time, one of them is going to find themselves in a very helpless place where his life is coming to an end. Right? Where his, you know, whatever masters he had have decided to end his life. And before he ends his life, he should know about a master who can bless him even beyond this life. Which is why the first thing he talked about is, I have left to people that don't believe in an afterlife. Because one of them is about to see the afterlife pretty soon. Right? So that's one of the first things he brought up in his da'wah. So he's taking into consideration, I want to prepare this person to meet with Allah 
and for that, that to be, for this bad outcome to actually become a good outcome for them. Regardless, he breaks this news to them, and both of them have now been told what their dream means. You can imagine on the other side, the other one is pretty happy that he's going to get out, and all he's going to be thinking about, man, when I get out, I'm going to eat that fa my favorite sandwich, and I'm going to eat these, I'm going to eat those French fries. I haven't had those fries in a long time, and I can't, I can't wait to go home. I wonder what my home looks like. I can't wait to see my family, etc. He's got all these thoughts in his head. He's in prison, but in his mind, he's already free, right? He's already imagining how things are going to be when he gets out. Right? Because the date, you know, if, if this is true, then this is actually pretty amazing news. Now he's not, he doesn't believe in Yusuf as a prophet. But, and we're not saying necessarily that the moment they heard it, they absolutely believe what he said. Because it's not like us, if we come to ask a question of, if we were living in the Sahaba's time, and asked a question to the Prophet and he gave us an answer, it would be the absolute truth for us. They're not believers yet, right? So even Yusuf salam telling them what this dream means, they don't have to actually accept it. And you can imagine one of them, even if he doesn't accept it, he kind of hopes it's true. And the other one, even if he doesn't accept it, he kind of hopes it's what? It's false. And those are the two ranges of emotions when you share the truth with someone. When you share the truth with someone, maybe they like it. Maybe they're drawn to the truth from the inside. And maybe you share the truth with someone, and they hate it. They know that it's true, or they have a feeling that it's true, but they hate it. Like, why, why did that have to be the truth? Couldn't you give me some other truth that could make me feel better, like the other one? Can't you give me his, his kind of interpretation? Maybe I'll come out and feed birds bread. <laughs> give me a different interpretation. Give me something that'll make me feel better. The thing about sharing the truth, especially on behalf of Allah, is sometimes we share something that gives comfort. And if someone comes and asks something on behalf of Allah's deen, Right? And Yusuf has been taught by Allah how to answer these kinds of questions. We don't have that knowledge, but we have Allah's book. We have the sunnah of His Prophet So if somebody comes to a person of knowledge and asks them a question about something, it can very well be that they really like the answer. It could be that answer gave me a lot of comfort. That answer made me feel really good. Like which one? Like the guy who's going to get out and he's going to get his old job back. I'm, it, it, an answer that has relief in it. An answer that has the end of my troubles. An answer that has an optimistic future. That, that sounds really good. You know, so if, if I were to give a khutbah about hope and Allah, you know, alleviating your troubles, it can feel consoling to my heart and yours. But on the other hand, sometimes you have to, on behalf of Allah, share harsh realities. Tough love. The truth isn't always sweet and gentle. The truth is sometimes a painful reality. And that reality can be a pretty hard slap on the face. It can be pretty... And when you get it, your first response is, no, there must be another way to look at it. There has you are so narrow-minded, and you, are, you have a bias, I don't think you properly understand. That's why you're saying this. Because we want to hear something that feels good. We don't want to hear something that doesn't feel good. And from the one who's calling people to Allah, they might have to take that into consideration and say, hey, maybe I shouldn't share this because I don't think it's going to get a good reaction. I know it's the truth. I know this is what the ayah says. I know this is what the Prophet ﷺ said. And I studied what the Prophet ﷺ said. And I came to an understanding clearly with all the study of the evidence in the background is what this statement of the Prophet ﷺ means. But I don't think I should share it publicly because some people won't like it. I don't know if they can handle it. They might feel like I'm giving them a death sentence. Get it? They might feel like that. And maybe as a result of that, I should not share what I know. Because maybe I, every, thing, every time I open my mouth, maybe I should just talk about feel-good things. I don't want to be the feel-bad guy, then people won't listen to me. I want to be the feel-good guy. That's what I want to do. The problem with the, that is that you're taking half the legacy of the Prophets. Not the other half. Bashiran wa nadiran. They come to give good news and they come to give warning. Now, no, ain't nobody like warning. When you warn somebody, it's not just there's a storm coming. When you warn somebody, you're warning, you better stop that because it, it's going to cost you. That what you're doing is wrong, I'm warning you. What you're saying is wrong, I'm warning you. How you're earning is wrong, I'm warning you. Warnings don't feel good. What we learn from Yusuf alayhi salam is, in no situation is he going to compromise that what he says might be offensive. And there's no might be. I'm pretty sure the guy who heard his dream interpreted that he's going to get executed is offended. His feelings are hurt. Seriously? 
I don't like this guy. He thinks, nah, <laughs> actually, never mind. I was just kidding. I didn't see Idri. I was just, I just had too much bread. You know, that's, so he might even brush it off. Right? Now Yusuf salam has to be straightforward about what he just said because what he got was from revelation. He didn't tell one of them good news because he likes him or the other one bad news because he doesn't like him. His personal feelings had nothing to do with what he just said. Right? Had nothing to do with what he just said. Even though to one he gave good news and the other he gave bad news. And by the way, this is pretty powerful stuff for anybody who's in the field of da'wah or sharing something on behalf of Allah Azza wa Jal. You have to be able to share both and keep your feelings out of it. You have to, you, you, you know, what Allah says is what He says, regardless of how someone else feels about it. And I'm not even talking about non-Muslims hearing the word of Allah and having an averse reaction. We live in a time where you can share the word of Allah as best you can, as honestly as you can with believers, and they'll say no. That's not what that means. You're just, you're, you're being extreme, or you're doing this. Or you're, okay, I'm, I'm all of those things. But I just, if you ask me what Allah says, to the best of my understanding, that's what He says. And then, if we try to reinterpret the word of Allah with feeling better in mind, then feeling better is our God, not Allah. That's the truth of it. Then our feelings are the, what dictate what the word of Allah means. But no one dictates what the word of Allah means except Allah. وَكَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلْيَا The word of Allah is in the highest place. Now, what He said is pretty shocking. And it might even make one of these guys angry at the other. You get to go and I get to get killed? What is this? Tell me how you got this answer. I, I need a better explanation. Maybe they want to argue back. Or the guy who's going to get free is like, so how much am I going to get paid? Did you get that too? Or, you know, or, am I going to get a house with this too? Maybe he wants some more details. Right? What did Yusuf salam say to them right after he described the answer? He says, قُضِيَ الْأَمْرُ الَّذِي فِيهِ تَسْتَفْتِيَانِ the matter in which you were seeking my verdict, seeking a verdict, has already been decided. It's already been dictated. Meaning, whether or not you accept what I'm saying or not, this is actually the decree of Allah. I didn't decide this, Allah did. I have no... The only thing I can do is let you know what He said, what He taught me, but actually the decision's already been made, and negotiating it with me won't change what Allah says. Now this is an important part. Why even say the matter about which you sought the verdict has already been decided? When do you say to somebody, the decision's already been made? The judge has already passed a verdict. When somebody wants to argue after that, no, the hammer's already been dropped. It's, it's done. The case is over. You can't argue anymore. It's done. You know? And that suggests that, they were, that there may be room for them not to be happy, or one of them for not to be happy with the verdict that's been given. Or to have further questions about the verdict that's been given. And that has universal value for us. Because it may be that when we hear the verdict passed by Allah on some issue, and it goes against what we were hoping to hear, then you know what, we can, what tendency we can develop? We can say, well, I heard this, and I heard the arguments behind it, they're pretty sound, but I don't like this conclusion because it's not in my favor. So I'm going to go find someone else who looks just as religious, but they'll tell me what I want to hear. But if I go to them and they still tell me what I don't want to hear, I'll go to a third person and see if they can mold the religion to my liking. Until I find a shaykh who can shake to my will and finally give me the answer that I want. And you, so what that becomes is, you can find someone who will give you what you want, but it won't change the decree of Allah. You understand that like people can give you what you want. You can buy a fatwa if you want. There are places you could do that. There are people who can interpret the religion however you want them to interpret it. They could do that. You know, it's kind of like uh, accounting. When you, have, when you go to a corrupt accountant, they don't say how much do you owe in tax. They say how much you want to pay in tax. <laughs> they'll, then they'll do your tax. How much you want to pay. <laughs> right? Like it's a negotiation. Uh, the truth won't change. What you, what you made is what you made. What you withheld is what you withheld. That's not going to change. The same way he's actually letting them know that I know this is hard to hear, or this may even be hard for you to believe. But the thing is that this wasn't up to me. This has already been decreed. A subtle note that I wouldn't use in translation, but I would certainly say in, um, in, in, in the linguistic analysis, a literary analysis of these words, Pretty interesting that the first words we learned about these young men were, وَدَخَلَ مَعَهُ السِّجْنَةِ 
Fatayan. Fatayan means two young men. And at the end, قُضِيَ الْأَمْرَ الَّذِي فِيهِ تَسْتَفْتِيَان Tastaftiyan is from the same root letters as Fatayan. Fatayan, Tastaftiyan. Now Tastaftiyan means those of you, both of you were seeking, are seeking a verdict from me. Now the thing is, about this word, the word youth and the word seeking a, a verdict, seeking a fatwa. You've heard the word fatwa before? Futuwa actually means youth. And what does fatwa, meaning a verdict, have to do with youth? The idea is that youth is when you are empowered. Hassan, Hassan Jabal in his root analysis describes in Al-Mu'jam Al-Ishtiqaqi Al-Mu'assal Li Kalimat Al-Qur'an that when someone comes seeking a fatwa and they get the answer, that, am, that answer empowers them. It energizes them. Like youth is full of what? Strength and energy. So an answer that empowers you is, is istifta. Behind it, behind a fatwa is something that's supposed to empower you. It's an interesting word that's been used here, perhaps to suggest, not only have I interpreted this dream for you, but I have, you asked about something that concerns you for your life. But the words that I gave you are more than just your dreams. I gave you things that can empower you and keep you young even if you get executed. So I've given you something that you, and, and that has been decreed. Even that has been decreed. So it's a beautiful choice. It's a subtle thing. Literally, you would translate what you seek a verdict in. But what you seek to be empowered with is kind of under, underlying there. What you sought to be empowered with has also been given to you and has also been decreed. Meaning, not only has your death and your life been decreed, but the deen that can empower you has also been decreed for you. That's also been given to you. Just like life and death, just like the air you breathe is a rizq Allah provided to you, this deen is also a rizq that Allah provided to you. That can nourish your heart. Just like the food nourishes your body. Now, at, at, you know, this is the 41st ayah and this is the end of the kind of the da'wah section of the, the, the story, right? And before we move on, what I wanted to share with you, and especially this is for those who are uh, involved in the field of da'wah. There are lots of da'wah organizations that deal with non-Muslims. Uh, there are services where people can call in and ask questions of non-Muslims. Some of you are in college and university students and you sometimes set up things like in America, we set up things like Islam Awareness Week and people come in and ask questions about Islam. Sometimes masjids have tours and things like that and non-Muslims come in and ask all kinds of questions. Sometimes you have non-Muslim friends at work or other maybe family and they start asking questions about Islam or want to have a conversation with you about the faith. What I wanted to do here is just imagine for a moment that the few words of Yusuf and this brief exchange is a book on da'wah. This is not just a few words, it's actually a book with multiple chapters, right? And this is a book on da'wah inspired by the conversation Allah recorded of Yusuf السلام, and two strangers, two young men, right? If you were to imagine it as a book, somebody can come up with much better framework than I can, but here's what it would look like, in, at, at least at a preliminary level. So here are some chapters of this book. And these chapters are not well named because they're long sentences, but you get the idea. As I wasn't sitting there thinking about publishing a book on this, but for those of you that are in this field, and have been in this field for many years, I'm sure you can furnish each of these chapters with very real case studies. Because Yusuf alayhi salam is a case study. But you may, for your 20 years of da'wah, have 100 case studies that go under each of these and how, because experience is a teacher too, right? And you may have seen these ayat come to life with your experience. And that's the power of ayat of the Qur'an. There, there are words in a book for us, but they're lived experience also. Right? So you can correlate the word of Allah with your experience, maybe perhaps based on this kind of a framework and inshallah even a better framework that some of you might come up with. So the first chapter would be, let your character be the first invitation. إِنَّا نَرَاكَ مِنَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ He didn't say a word. They saw the way he carries himself, they came to him. So chapter one, let your character be the first invitation. Chapter two, hear others out, be a good listener. Because they came, started talking about their dream, they didn't care about what he wants, or who he is, or nothing, they just came. You seem like a good person, here's our dream, here's what we're having trouble with. Hear people out, hear their concerns. Number three, let your concern for their concern be known. You don't just hear them out and say, aha, aha, but what about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the akhirah? You know? Like somebody comes to your booth, hey man, I, just, I heard you guys have free pizza. Yes, 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 you can have pizza, but uh, do you believe... Do you know what the Qur'an, the word of Allah? It's the word of Allah. Who's, what, what? Allah, what's that? Who's that? What's that? And you just go straight into, you're not listening. 
They just say, hey man, you want some pizza? Yeah, we got pretty good pizza. You know where we got it from? This place, this place, this place. You want, how many slices do you want to get? Let me go get those slices for you. But while I get them for you, I want to tell you about something. You see what I'm saying? You hear someone out and you let them know that you're concerned about what they came to you for. And so, let your concern for their concern be known. Remember how Yusuf Alayhi said to them, before food gets here, I'll, I'll have told you. So that he let them know that I am concerned with what you shared to me, shared with me. If you're able to help, say so. Is he able to help them with their dream? Yes. Is it possible they came to him with some other issue that he can't help them with? It's possible that somebody asked you for something you're not able to help with. Then if you can't help, then don't pretend that you can help. <laughs> if you don't know, then say no. He's able to say, this is something my master has taught me, so I can help you. So it's not like every time someone comes and asks you for help, you say, yep, yep, mm -hmm, I can do that. No, <laughs> maybe you can. Maybe Allah hasn't taught you. Maybe you don't know enough, and you should be okay in accepting, I don't know. But if you are able, then say, okay, so if you are able to help, say so, and give credit to Allah for enabling you. In other words, yeah, I can help you, I'm pretty good at that. No, yeah, I can help you because that is part of what my master has taught me. Those are his words. Right, so give credit to Allah. Because that again, da'wah has already started. That, because you, for your own self, and they're thanking you for helping them, but you're saying, but I thank Allah for letting me help you. Because I wouldn't have been able to help you if Allah didn't let me. So you're actually demonstrating gratitude by example. You're not just telling them to be grateful, you showed it yourself first. You, just by that word. Right? So that's, that's our chapter 4. Then chapter 5, share your story. And who and what you left behind. And why. I've left a, the religion of a people that don't believe in Allah. Maybe, maybe the one giving da'wah says, Man, I used to be, you know, I used to be Christian. I used to be, somebody says, what are you doing here? Like, you're, you don't look Muslim. You don't look like, are you like really Muslim? No, yeah, well, I have a little story. And you maybe share something of your story. Briefly, you don't have to give your biography. He didn't give his biography. Man, my brothers, you know what they did to me. And then I was, that's a pretty crazy story, bro. That's, that's not what he did. He just simply said, I left the, you know, I left something. There, there's a, I had a past, and I realized that that was darkness. And I realized that this was, this was the truth. And I became convinced of it. And it brought me, it, it brought me to this. Allah brought me to this. Even sharing a little bit of, you know, I, I've taken a journey myself is actually helpful for someone else. You know, so that's inni talaktu millat taqawm. So that's chapter six. Number seven, share how blessed you are to maintain faith in just one God and how this blessing is waiting for everyone if they choose to be grateful. That this is an open invitation to believe in one single God. And that's actually a very interesting concept. We think that's a very common thing. Yeah, lots of religions believe in one God. Mm, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. There is no other religion other than Islam that believes in a singular God in a way that cannot be compared to any creation that has no limitations, none whatsoever, is perfect in every way. There is no religion on the face of this earth that has that concept other than Islam. None. Christianity will attribute Trinity. Christianity will attribute a human being being sacrificed. Christianity will attribute other kinds of things that take away from Allah being perfect in every way. Judaism will say that, you know, the rabbis will even say that they, you know, someone wrestled God and won. Or Abraham, you know, finally when he questioned God, God was proud of him because he was correcting God when he was saying that you shouldn't kill the people of Lot, etc., etc. Imperfections attributed to Allah. So it's not even in the previous scriptures books, let's the truth be told, the concept of God as an all perfect, you know, loving, perfectly merciful, perfectly just, perfectly loving, perfectly knowing, perfectly wise, all those attributes of perfection coming together in the way that they do with the concept of God in Islam is nowhere found anywhere else on this planet in no other religion. My good friend, I remember, and I wonder if he's watching this. He used to be a librarian in um, Arkansas State University um, in Little Rock, John Goodell. He was a librarian and he was a philosophy major. And he studied different religions. And he, this was his conclusion about the way God is described in Islam. And he, before he even became Muslim, because he went back to his bachelor's notes when he became Muslim. And his bachelor's notes under Islam were, this Tawheed thing is pretty awesome. <laughs> That's what he wrote there. Right? That's what I remember him telling me. So 
the, you know, share the uniqueness of that one God. And you know, when you say that, that we believe in one God, there may be others who say, no, 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 we believe in one God too. They could just come right back and say that. And that's when you start posing the question, really, are multiple masters better or, or one? Because when you say one, is it really one? Let me show you how they're not. Let me show you how you don't actually believe in one God. And is that uh, the, the concept of one that you have, that where you're still divided into other masters or given others authority, is that better? You know, one time I had an interesting TV uh, interview. Um, it wasn't supposed to be a debate, debate. It was supposed to be a conversation. It was a Catholic fellow. And he was talking to me and, you know, wanted to ask questions about Islam. And I, so I said, so you, you believe in saints? And he said, yeah. So, the, you know, he was wearing an amulet. So the saint so-and-so protects you. He goes, yeah. So why doesn't God protect you directly? Why does he need a saint to protect you? And why do you have to call on the saint? Why can't you just call on God to protect you? I mean, he's protecting the entire universe, isn't he? The saint isn't protecting the universe. He isn't keeping the sun in its place or the cloud. So why, why do you need to refer to a saint in order to protect you? Why, aren't you? why can't you have direct access to God? He says, you know, Islamic architecture in Spain is so remarkable. <laughs> he just completely changed the subject. I was like, yeah, it is. But the same thing I still don't understand. Pose the question. If somebody claims, no, 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 it's fine. I believe in that kind of stuff too. Actually, you don't. And how can you? So make that known. And then, so that's, uh, you know, that's chapter 7. Chapter 8 is honor people. Ya sahibai sijin. My two companions in prison. Speak to people respectfully. Call them out. Call them by their name. Call them by a title that makes them feel like you care. Nobody talks to them that way. Yo! Hey! Hey, short stuff. Hey, fatty. That's how they call each other in prison. And he's like, my two companions in the prison. He's like, man, he's real nice. Nobody called me sir before. Nobody's... Why is he be treating me with so much respect? And giving people respect can actually already soften the heart before you even say anything. Right? So, honor people is a chapter by itself. Then number nine, pose the question, what's the difference between many masters and one? Chapter 10, be bold enough to call falsehood, falsehood. Be bold enough to say these are names you've just made up. They have no value. Allah never authorized them. He's the only one who has rule. He, he commanded that we should only worship Him. Amar Allah ta'abudu illa Be bold enough to just say what's wrong is wrong. And that may be offensive, isn't it? But you have to just come out and say it. And then number, uh, number 11, once you've been bold enough to declare Allah and declare false gods are false gods, then you need to be bold enough to stand by the timeless values of your own religion. Not just your God, but the values He taught you. ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمُ That's the deen whose values stand tall. Remember they don't budge that tree that doesn't move? Right? Stand by your values. You can't just talk about a God and then abandon his values for political reasons. You can't just talk about one Allah and pray to him in the masjid and everything else, but the values that he has taught in his book, you've put them aside because you want to make alliances with people that stand for things opposite to the values of Allah. You can't. You can't. Then you, you have to stand by this deen. ذَلِكَ دِينُ الْقَيِّمُ And finally he interpreted their dream, what I showed you today. yeah. And in the, that would be the last chapter, help people. Help people, and but help people, I would add here, help people honestly. Because helping someone sometimes means you'll hear something, like a doctor, sometimes they'll give you news, your test came back negative, you're clear. But the doctor can also give you your test came back positive, it's not good. You need to go for operation, you need to have surgery, you need to do this or that. The truth is, when you help people, sometimes you have to give them good news, and sometimes you have to give them bad news. So help people honestly. Be honest in the way you help people. So these are some chapters in a book of da'wah. If there were one, based on the, the methodology applied by Yusuf Ali. I mean, it's pretty comprehensive actually. It's got you know, a, a, a bunch going on in there. Now, it's interesting that there are 12 chapters, 12 brothers. I, 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 silly. But anyway. قَالَ لِلَّذِي ظَنَّ أَنَّهُ نَاجِمْ مِنْهُمَا أُذْكُرْنِي عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ he said to the one who was convinced, the, 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 he said to the one, 
about whom he was convinced, meaning Yusuf salam was convinced that he's going to be rescued or he's going to be saved from the two of them. So which one is he talking about now? The guy, the cup bearer, right? So one of them, the word dhanna is used, he was convinced that he's going to be saved. But dhanna is also used for thought or assumption. The word dhanna basically means when you become convinced of something or you're sure about something based on certain evidences. Now some people have very strong thought process, right? So they really carefully look at all the evidences before they become what? Convinced. Other people can watch Fox News and become convinced. And they can be very sure about their conviction also, right? Whether your evidences or what you looked at to arrive at a conclusion is weak, your certainty is still pretty certain, isn't it? You're pretty sure about it. And that realization or that assumption or that certainty, that's called one. So one could be false and one could be true. One could be weak because it's based on weak assumptions. So it itself is weak. Or one could be very strong because it's based on very strong assumptions. One could also be that your assumptions are very weak, but you're pretty hard-lined on it anyway. You're stuck on it anyway. So one has this range of conviction. This is the word used for Yusuf alayhi salam suggesting that what Allah had taught him, he took all into consideration before arriving at the conclusion because Allah had taught him how to analyze dreams and he took all of that into consideration before actually being absolutely convinced that one of them is going to be rescued and the word najin is an ism fa'il what that means is two things he's going to be rescued pretty soon that's inside the word and najin also because it's an ism guarantees that he's going to be rescued, it's stronger language. So he's absolutely getting out of here, and it's gonna happen pretty soon. So Yusuf salam knows two things about this man, he's not gonna be here for long, and he's definitely getting out of here. Okay, so those two things are inside, الَّذِي ظَنَّ uh, uh, وَقَالَ Let me uh, go back to the ayah again. I lost my place. Okay, وَقَالَ لِلَّذِي ظَنَّ أَنَّهُ نَاجِمْ مِنْهُمَا He said to the one who he was convinced is going to be rescued from the two of them. What did he say to him? أُذْكُرْنِي عِنْدَ رَبِّكْ Mention me in the company of your master. Now he already mentioned before, you're going to serve your master drink. Remember that? Now he's saying, mention me in the company of your master. Now this has been interpreted in a range of ways. Some people have said, mention my, mention my case to him. Tell him I've been imprisoned falsely, etc. Right? Just bring bring my name to his attention because I'm not even on the docket. I'm not even my case isn't even on file. I was unlawfully just thrown in here, and they don't even know that I'm in here, right? Because they just made me disappear. That's basically what happened, right? So make mention of me when you get a chance to your master. But and others have said. Mention me to him so that he pulls me out of here so I can give him da'wah also, which to me feels like a stretch, at least in this context. But that has been suggested as a possible interpretation also. What seems to be more plausible because of the word inda, inda means proximity. So if I say, ana inda al-masjid, I am inda the masjid, what that means is I'm in the proximity of the masjid. I'm right by the masjid, I'm in the area of the masjid, etc. That's inda. Okay? When he says, not uthkurni li rabbik, mention me to your master. Instead of saying to your master, he said inda rabbik, which means mention me around your master. Mention me in the proximity of your master. Meaning, you're going to be serving drinks, and you know, there are other servants there too. You're like, I can't believe Yusuf was right. Right? You just kind of just throw his name out there. And the, the king will be like, or the minister, governor, whoever, other people, y- Yusuf? What do you mean? That same Yusuf that used to work for Aziz, who was his right-hand man, that used to take care of all of his tasks, who was the VP basically of the household, that disappeared? We never had, Is that the same Yusuf? Because we don't know any Yusuf by that name. Why wouldn't they have another Yusuf? Because Yusuf is not from Egypt, and his name isn't an Egyptian name. So his name is also unique. Plus, he was in the middle of a controversy surrounding VIP women, which means all the VIPs know his name, because they're trying to hide the controversy. Right? So if his name even pops up among servants, in a governmental house, anywhere, somebody's bound to say, wait, I just thought he disappeared. He's around? Just his name might stir up an inquiry, you understand? So he's being very subtle and saying, just bring my name up. Enough people knew me and respected me and appreciated what I did for them. 
Because he wherever because we know he's Muhsin, right? He just does good to people wherever he goes. So enough people know what kind of contributor I was and cared for me that may not know anything that ever happened to me. So maybe just the mention of my name might stir up an investigation that might bring about me coming out of here. You understand? So that's he's just saying, I'm not asking you to go and make a case and ask him. To ask your king what happened to those women that cut their hands or tell them the minister falsely imprisoned me. He didn't ask for any of that. He just said, just bring my name up. Which is pretty remarkable. Because the only way this could be a successful strategy is that he has established his credibility in that circle far and wide. Among the servants, among the masters, among the elite, among the kings. Around there, his name is kind of a, a phenomenon. They know because he stands out. And that goes back to him being Muhsin, that Allah said twice, آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ إِنَّا نَرَاكَ مِنَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Allah says that's how we compensate those who excel, and we see you as those who excel. So both times we see that name. And you know, no, no master like the Aziz would come to a slave and say, just ignore what happened here. He would just tell him, you better shut up. You better not say it. But the way he's talking to him, his character has elevated him from above slave, even to his own master. He, he won't talk to him that way. He'll, he's like, it's almost like he's negotiating with him. Just ignore what happened here. أَعْرِدْ عَنْ هَذَا And you ask forgiveness. Can you imagine that happening with an, like a, the, the slave and the woman of the house and she's getting yelled at and he's being talked to in this way? That means he was an, his elevated character actually had this impression on people, even people that's supposed to have authority over him, were intimidated by his presence, and would te- speak to him with a certain kind of reverence. So his name carries this power, which is to me one of the most amazing qualities of Yusuf alayhi salam. He's not a preacher, he's not going around preaching about Allah and his messenger, you know, or, or his, his messengers, Ibrahim alayhi salam. He's not doing, we don't hear him do da'wah in the, in, in the castle. We didn't hear him do that when he was a slave, when being, being sold. The only time we hear him open his mouth is when he sees that he can actually talk about it. And when people came and asked him. Otherwise he was to himself. But what was it about him that was speaking so much volumes that now he's in a position, when he's in trouble, he can just say, just bring up my name and something might happen. Something Because people know. Those who know, know. You don't have to say anything more than just my name. How does someone get to that point? It's only and only character. It's hukman wa ilman. The way you carry yourself is hukum. And on top of that is the knowledge. May Allah Azza wa make us of those kinds of people. So that's what he says to him. Uthkurni inda rabbik. On this, um, the, the next phrase that's coming is actually a pretty complex phrase. Uh, and before I get to it, I'm going to finish my commentary on this half of the ayah and then deal with the complexity next week, inshallah ta'ala, on 42. But um, what I want to share with you today, at least, is a summary of what Amin Hassan Islahi in his Urdu tafsir, Tadabur al Quran, talks about, which is pretty beautiful. I found it very beautiful. He says, Allah has made a, a, me- a system, a mechanism, in the way that He wants His slaves to live in this world. And what He wants His slaves to do is take whatever means he has given them. Because he says he put whatever on the earth for you. Take the resources of this world and put them to use. Take every opportunity and make the most of it. And while you make the most of it, know that success and failure lies in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. And when you make the most of it and you don't cross Allah's lines, then that is exactly your purpose in this life to make the most of worldly resources within the bounds that Allah set for you to do good for yourself and to do good for others. But stay within those bounds. Don't cross those bounds. And when someone stays within those bounds, they are demonstrating their faith in Allah. They are demonstrating their tawakkul in Allah. Musa alayhi salam's mother, when the baby was floating away, has, she could just sit, because Allah, by the way, Allah had promised her Inna radduhu ilayki. Pay attention to this part, it's coming back to this. He says, we will bring him back to you. Pay attention to those words. We will no doubt bring him back to you. If I told you, hey, uh, this, this pen I'm taking from you, I'll bring it back to you. Does that mean you have to come to my house and get it? Or I'm coming back to your house? I'm coming back to your house. Because I said, I will bring it back to you. Musa's mother was told, Musa, about Musa, 
I will, we will return him back to you. If she heard those words, you know what she should be doing? I'm just going to sit back. Allah said he's going to bring him back to me. I see him floating away in the river. But Allah said he's going to what? Bring him back. Even though she has the promise of Allah, that Allah will bring him back, what does she do? She tells her, her, her daughter, go follow him. You could say you should have tawakkul in Allah. Allah told you that he will bring him back. Sit back and just thank Allah that you have the guarantee of Allah. No, 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 no. Whatever resources you have at your disposal, you will use while you have the promise of Allah. The promise of Allah that things will work out does not mean you get to take a back seat. It doesn't mean that. Yusuf a.s. the only one who can get him out of prison is who? Is Allah. But he's not going to sit back and say, I don't need you to say anything. I'm just going to just be here. Um, would you need anything? No, 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 don't worry about it. It's okay. No, he's going to take whatever resource at his disposal and use it. And that's exactly what we should do. If there's any hope that that might bring up some investigation, then he should use that resource, yes or no? Any human being in that position would do exactly the same thing. That would be the smart thing to do. That would be the wise thing to do. And it's not a negation of one's faith. That doesn't mean, oh, I don't trust Allah enough, that's why I ask for help. Actually, the fact that you're asking for help or asking for your name to be mentioned is exactly what Allah would want you to do. That's exactly what Allah would want you to do. Because Allah put those people in your path for exactly this reason. Exactly this reason. Because you were supposed to have this conversation with them, because you were le- supposed to leave a lasting impression on them, an impression that will eventually, we know the story forward, going forward, an impression that will last several years for the guy who survived. To the point that several years later, he remembers a few minutes of conversation. Several years later, he remembers it. And comes back. Why did that happen? Because this conversation took place. Uthkurni عند Rabbik. Now, there is... The other view, which, we're get, which I said makes this, uh, the study of this ayah complex. I will tell you there's a, there's a delicate balance we have to strike when talking about prophets, alayhim salam And what I don't personally, and I, you, have, you have the right to come up with your own conclusions and study and inshallah, you know, uh, find what you feel most con- contenting to your heart, like what, what gives contentment to your heart when it comes to this ayah particularly, because it's one of the mushkilat al-Qur'an, one of the difficult subjects in the Qur'an. Today, usually I have an hour-long conversation with Shaykh Suhaib Sayyid, today I think we were at it for three and a half hours on this ayah. Just back and forth, questions, confusions, back and because, and I'm still somewhere in the, in the gray when it comes to my own thoughts on this ayah. But I, before I leave you, I, I do want to be transparent enough in sharing with you what is the, 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 the intellectual problem in this ayah. Okay, and I've also asked Dr. Akram for some help uh, in understanding the rest of this ayah, and I want, I'm waiting for his response to me also, and I'll share it with my Qur'an study group and have some exchange with them about it also, to really get a better grasp of the subject before I talk about it, inshallah. But here's the thing. There's a common claim made, and it's found in tafsir, that Yusuf alayhi salam said, mention me to your master. And as a result of mentioning him, mention me to your master, he didn't put enough trust in Allah. And as a result of that, Allah kept him in prison. That as a result of him not mentioning Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah then decided, because the fa is used and fa could be sababiya. So the latter part of the ayah is going to be fa'ansahu shaitan dhikra rabbihi. Which most literally would mean the devil made him forget to mention his master. The most literal translation of that phrase, if you do no grammatical further analysis, the straightforward analysis would be, mention me to your master, then Allah, then the devil made him, now who's, there's two hymns possible, yes? One hymn could be Yusuf, the other hymn could be the guy who's the cupbearer, right? So many have gone with Yusuf in their tafsir. So let me go with that interpretation and translate it now, if we go with that. Then the devil made Yusuf forget mentioning his master when he said, what words? Mention me to your master. So he only talked about mention me to your master, hopefully this will work out. But at that moment, he did not mention who? Allah Azza wa And then Allah says, فَلَبِثَ فِي السِّجْنِ بِدْعَ سِنِينَ And th- therefore, you can translate fa as therefore, it can be sababiyah. Therefore, he remained in the prison for a number of years. Now if you read it that way, that means that Allah Azza wa Jal 
was not happy with Yusuf alayhi salam not mentioning his name, and as a result of him not mentioning his name, the course of history changed and he had to remain in prison for another few years. Okay, that's one reading. Another reading is, uh, and that would be a little bit of grammatical, uh, um, I don't want to say gymnastics, but grammatical flexibility to get to that translation. It's not as direct. It's not as direct. And here's what it's going to be. فَأَنْسَاهُ أُذْكُرْنِي عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ Mention me in the company of your master. فَأَنْسَاهُ الشَّيْطَانُ ذِكْرَ رَبِّهِ Then the devil made the cupbearer forget mentioning him to his master. Okay, so now you got two very different translations. You've got either Yusuf forgot to mention Allah when he was saying, mention me to your master. Or the, the, the cupbearer got out and when he got out, he was so happy with his freedom and he's got his job or whatever and he's trying to find the right opportunity to bring up maybe this thing about Yusuf but he's not finding the time, not finding the right words, he's too shy to say something and over time, he didn't get the time, didn't get the time, didn't get the time and it lost his consciousness and he just forgot about it. Right? And Allah is describing that as the shaitan made him forget mentioning, mentioning what? Yusuf to his master, except the words two aren't there. The words to are can be implied grammatically. It's more of a flexible tra- interpretation of the grammar. It's possible. But the more explicit one is actually the one attributing this to Yusuf a.s. That Yusuf a.s. forgot to mention. That shaitan was able to make him forget mentioning his master. Now both of these are pretty heavy. Because then it raises a lot of questions. Why is this complicated? It's complicated because are we saying that Allah punished Yusuf a.s. for not mentioning his name for, by keeping him in prison for several years? Is that what we're saying? Because Allah, this is the same Allah who's told us about him over and over again, that he's taking care of him, that he's his nurturing master, that he's protecting him, that he's you know, taking over his affair. And the fact that he even got put into prison is because Allah says he removed this, this, their scheme from them. Then the other pr- question that arises is, if we go with that interpretation, you know, he's spent all this time talking about Allah. And now all of a sudden we're assuming that he didn't remember Allah. Right? How do we reconcile those two things? Then it's the fact that the shaitan made him forget. Shaitan made him forget. And are we okay with attributing that to a prophet? That the shaitan made a prophet forget, remembering Allah. You understand? So there are these important questions that would have to be answered if we go with that interpretation. Now this is a classical interpretation. Several scholars have discussed this interpretation. So this is not something obscure or rare. or Because the grammar actually very directly points in that direction. It directly point, you can't ignore that interpretation. Because if you're going to be true to the language of the Qur'an, then there's no way to escape that possible meaning. The other possible meaning is also there, that it's talking about the cupbearer. And so the cupbearer forgot to mention him to his master. But it seems, like Alusi and other scholars have mentioned, it seems Allah is intending both. Allah is intending, actually implying both. The devil did make the cupbearer forget, but Yusuf salam also forgot to mention the name of his master at this point. So that saying that about a prophet is a very delicate thing. It's not an easy thing for me to talk about. Because I'm pre-programmed to have for all of our messengers, all of our prophets, a, an extra level of reverence, an extra level of regard and, and, and innocence attributed to them. And any way we can protect their dignity, we do. And the scholars who wrote the Fasir were the same way. They were the same way. So we don't give them, we don't not give them credit for doing that. But we also have to be true to the text as much as we can be. So that's the balance that I'm going to try to strike, inshallah ta'ala, in our next session. And I think we've come to a pretty good place in understanding it, Sheikh Sohib and I, uh, after quite a bit of discussion. But I want to kind of methodically lay that out for you to help you. A lot of times I don't go into the complexities of issues, but this is one of those things where I want to hurt your brain a little bit. I want you to think about these things in a systematic way and the thought process that goes behind it before we arrive at conclusions and what conclusions are possible. So I'm going to lay the conclusions out this time. You know, a lot of times in other parts of this story, there were several different interpretations. I didn't discuss them as much because they are not of as much importance as far as fundamentals of our faith. But this one has pretty powerful spiritual implications. And this is also important because Allah has said that everything he le- we learn about Yusuf salam is going to have ayat for us, ayatul lisailin. Right? So we got to learn something from this. Allah wants guidance for us from this. 
So we have to draw that carefully out for ourselves, for our own benefit, because to the best of our ability, we have to do every ayah as much justice as we can to the, to the best of our human ability. And then Allah will choose some other slaves in coming generations who will look at our work, and our work will be a pebble compared to the mountains they do. Right? So that's, that's just how the, the nature of this work is. The nature of this book is Allah opens the hearts and minds and wisdom to the, wh- whoever He wants. So we pray Allah Azza wa Jal opens our hearts and minds and, and helps us see and understand this in the most correct and pristine way and not take away any of the honor and dignity that is owed to our beloved prophets and especially in this case Yusuf alayhi salam. So with that inshallah ta'ala, I'll see you guys uh, on Monday with this series. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Okay, somebody pressed the button. Oh my God, I'm still live. Oh my God, the internet. Bye.